Thank you everyone very much for coming today. I did try to tell Dr. Ayla it make no difference if I sit or stand because it's about the same height. <laughs> <laughs> okay, with that we'll start our talk today. It's about zoonosis from pets other than cats and dogs. I'm sure you're all well aware of what different type of zoonosis associate with your cats and dogs, so I thought something cute and unexpected. And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Lily Jones, uh, one of the USF uh, Infectious Disease Fellows. So the overview of our talk today, uh, first we will discuss the different type of zoonosis associated with different pets, the route transmission of the each type of zoonosis. On the second part of the talk, we will focus on uh, different bacterial zoonosis. Now I'm a little biased on what I think is interesting and worthy of discussions. <laughs> We will uh, finally identify the high-risk group of patients and uh, discuss the different prevention strategy on how to avoid these. Let's start. Uh, the reason we care about zoonosis because we love our pets. They serve valuable roles in societies. And according to the American Veterinary Medical Association, in 2005-2006, about 63% of all U.S. households have at least one pet. I had two. And because of pets, it does carry a certain zoonotic risk, especially in the immunocompromised host. So let's define zoonosis as a type of animal disease that is transmissible to human. Humans are usually accidental hosts. And um, this illustrates the point of the importance of pet history in your clinical encounters. It's very important that you ask the patient what type of pet they have. So let's talk a little bit about transmissions. Um, the way you acquire different zoonosis could be through uh, infectious saliva that contaminate the bite wounds, skin abrasions, or mucous membrane, or fecal orals, meaning uh, the contaminated feces from your pet somehow got into your mouth. Insects bite from pets to human, or aerosol from body fluids, such as in the case of Q fever, or scratch, like cat scratch disease or contaminate water with animal urines in the case of leptospirosis. And with that, we will start our talk today about infection that associated with horses. Obviously, we in Florida, lots of people own horses, horse farms, and uh, racing competitively. So infection that associated with horses, through the fecal transmissions, Horse can pass on Salmonella, Campylobacter, Cryptosporidium, Giardia. Through cutaneous contacts, you can get dermatophytes infection from horse to human. Uh, through the aerosol route, you can acquire Rhodococcus, Brucella, or Coxiella bonetii, or mosquito bone disease, obviously equine encephalitis. Now, this is an outbreak of um, about 40, 30, 40 hospitalized horse that infected with a multi-drug resistant salmonella typhimeriums. And you're asking yourself, why do I care about a bunch of horse getting multi-drug resistant salmonella? Well, if the multi-drug resistant horse got salmonella, got the, um, the horse got multi-drug resistant salmonella, if you acquire that strain, then we need to know because the antibiotic treatments may be different. So this is a diagram of uh, the percentage of Salmonella typhimurium isolate from Minnesota's. At the top part is the trend, the percentage of the multi-drug resistant strain in humans, and at the bottom is the multi-drug resistant strain in animals. And as you can see, um, the top line up there in diagram A, the multi-drug resistant in humans is only about 30 percent or so across the years. At, but at the bottom, the multi-drug resistant salmonella strains are very prevalent in animals, at ranging anywhere from 70 to 90 percent. And multi-drug resistant is uh, determined as more than five antimicrobial drug resistant, with A for ampicillin, C for chloramphenicol, and K for canamycin, S for streptomycin, SU for sulfamethoxazole, and T for tetracyclines. So as you're aware, for, so for example, salmonella infection, we usually give either ceftriaxone or some type of quinolones for these type of treatments. But in the case of um, a zoonosis, salmonellosis, we have to send these things for susceptibility testing because it might be intermediate to ceftriaxone, for example. 
moving on to infection that associate with rabbits. Through the fecal transmissions, humans can acquire Salmonella, Yersinia pseudotuberculosis, Cryptosporidiums. As you can see, these are all GI type of diarrheal illness. Through the aerosol routes, humans can also acquire Bordetella bronchoseptica. And cutaneous contact is the metophyte. And obviously from wild rabbits, we all know we can get tularemia or rabbit fever from that. But since this is a talk about pets, we don't care wild rabbit, because they're not pet. <laughs> Moving on to deer, sheep, goats, and cattle. Does anyone know the happy cow from California? Okay, so the uh, fecal transmission route, again, so you have all these GIs issue causing di diarrheal illness with Salmonella, Yersinia enterocolitica, Campylobacter, E. coli 0157s, the Cryptosporidium, and lastly, Echinococcus. Through the aerosol routes, you can acquire Coxiella benetii, brucellosis, tick bite, you can get ehrlichiosis or an anaplasmosis. And through cutaneous contact, you can get parapox virus infections, which is known at all in human, or dermatophyte. Now, this is a life cycle of echinococcus. This demonstrates the relationship between dog, sheep, and humans, and how echinococcus can pass around very well. As you know, echinococcus is uh, live inside dogs or other canine as the definitive host, and the eggs are then shed through the feces of the dogs, the sheep that eat the infected materials from the feces in infected materials and then inside the sheep the oncosphere then hatch penetrate through the intestinal wall and then go on to invade other organs and causing cysts in livers, lungs and then the dogs get reinfected by eating the contaminated organs from sheep slaughtering. Human is kind of like a sheep. We kind of accidental host in the, the fact that we ingest the imprinot, uh ingest the eggs from the dogs and then inside the human intestine, the oncosphere also hatch, penetrate through the intestinal wall and go on to invade your organs and causing liver cysts or lung cysts that we know about. Now this is the pictures of, uh, on the left you see a cast skin of a liver cyst uh, with, multi multi um, with multiple cysts in the livers in the humans and on the right you can see a pathologic uh, specimens of the same things. Now, oof, this is how it looked like, the parapox infection looked like in sheep. And this is how human would present it, usually in isolated skin lesions on the hands. Another picture of the lesions on the hands. And you would get the story the patient tell you that either three weeks ago they were slaughtering a sheep for some sort of festival or cultural party, something like that. And that's how they come in contact with the contaminated um, raw materials, and that's how they acquired the parapox virus infections. Moving on, infection associated with rodents. Well, in this country, we love pet hamsters. I'm sure at one point or another, everyone has a pet hamsters. So, through the fecal transmission again, you can get seminolosis and infected saliva or bites of rodents, you can get tularemia, rat bite fevers, rabies. Through direct contact, one can get lymphocytic choreomeningitis virus, monkeypox virus, cowpox virus, hantavirus, and the metaphyse infections. Now, this is the reason why this was mentioned, because there have been quite a few case report of solid organ transplant associated with lymphocytic choreomeningitis in the United States as well as other developed countries like in Australia. And it's usually tracked back to the donors that have a pet hamsters and never have any issues because the donor was at some point an immunocompetent person, so never have any problems with the LCMV virus. But once the organs were donated and then put on into the host, the person who received those organs now immunocompromised and then developed these LCMV meningitis. So it's also a point to discuss with your immunocompromised patient. If they have a pet hamsters, they should either consider giving it to someone else or not handling them. 
in fashion associate with birds. Now when I wrote this slide, I think of this pretty birds. But then I have to think of, but also think about chickens, geese, ducks. I think those are birds as well. <laughs> so transmission by bodily fluid. We all know of cystocosis when we think about zoonosis associated with birds. Cryptococcus neoformin is another one of them. Through aerosol transmissions, you can get the avian flu or West Nile virus. And then through the fecal transmissions, when I think of baby chicks, salmonella again. And that's been a trend of uh, baby chick as pets in the backyard. So lots of people have it these days. So this is a case of the bird flus. With the birds having no issue at all, not even a hint of sniffles, but it has been an outbreak in humans, especially in 2009 when it's caused a lot of mortalities in this country. Now the other things to mention is about zoonosis that associate with birds is the apple virus surveillance programs. As you know, birds are the natural reservoirs for West Nile virus as well as other apple viruses and the CDC utilized this and used the chickens and geese in their sentinel program to do surveillance for the herbal viruses. So this represent a flock of chickens at the sentinel sites where Amy was kind enough to explain to me how they do this every week. <laughs> so as you can see, that's represent a flock and every week the epidemiologist would go to these sites and then test the chicken for antibodies for West Nile virus or others encephalitis virus. And if they test positive, then they will go out and spray these area to discreet mosquitoes. And therefore decrease this mode of transmissions of these West Nile virus or other viruses to humans. And this is a map of Tampa Bay area. With all the red dot you see is all the site that we have the sentinel chickens there. As you can see, McDill's Air Force Bay have one. And at the south, most of Tampa Bay have one too. So, you can see we use chickens <laughs> as our primary defense for apple viruses. It makes a different meaning to don't call me chickens, huh? Moving on, we have infection that associate with fish. Through the cutaneous transmission, we can get all these virus infections and usual, uh, bacterial infections, and lastly, parasitic infections. Now these infections mainly cause some sort of cutaneous skin lesions in humans. You can get Aeromonas, Vibrio vernificus, Salmonella, Campylobacter, Edwardsiella tata, Erysipelotrix, Mycobacterium marinum, and lastly, Natostomiasis. Does anyone know what that is? Yes. In case you don't know, so this is a fish pedicure. This is a new emerging trend in certain country in Asia when they have like a, a small fish pond would fill with all these fish and people would pay and put their foot in this pond and the fish would then go and munch on your dead skin. So you get a fish pedicure, like an exfoliate process. But can you imagine, obviously the waters are not chlorinated because that would kill all the fish. <laughs> And obviously the water is not changed after every person who put their feet in there. Can you see the problem? So this was published in the United Kingdom, obviously, and for safety reasons and zoonosis risk, the United States is not allowed to have these things. Thank you, Pat, Patrick. <laughs> so this is an infection of aromonas in the fish. And this is how it's presented in humans. You can see a case of cellulitis at the elbow there, or you can sometimes see bola eruptions along the arms as well. Similarly, this is how it would, uh, a vibrio infection would present in humans. And lots of the time you would see um, bola, hemorrhagic bolas or necrotizing fasciitis in humans. Now when I see this, I think of an aquarium, basically a big fish tank. 
And this is the type of infection that you would see associated with this. And therefore, it's lovingly called fish tank granuloma, causing by mycobacterium marinum infections. Fighting Nemo's. <laughs> so infection associated with reptiles. So through the fecal oral, you can obviously get salmonella or the early GI pathogen as well. True bite. I thought I included in this because it's important to ask the patient what type of pets they have and also to think outside the box. If they tell you they have a snake, they might get rat bite fever because they feed rat to the snake. Make sense? This is a multi-state outbreak of human salmonella infection associated with exposure to turtle in the United States from 2007 to 2008. This was published by the MMWR. And again, this is another warning about the pet turtles. They're cute, but they contaminate with salmonella. That's why the turtles say, I have salmonella. And wash your hands. <laughs> and that's why... The, uh, this case of the small turtles, they are, I have bans in the United States because, you know, obviously pet small turtles are so small that children put it in their mouth and swallow the whole things, and then obviously salmonella and other things would be problems. Lily, when there was this multi-state outbreak, yes. Well, most of these pet turtles are not just bred in the United States, it's also imported from other places. So, and when they sell it to pet store, you know, one turtle may be grouped with other turtles and stuff like that. So you never know where to trace back that source come from. Now, moving on to infection associated with exotic pets. This is the picture that inspired this talk. This is how I conceive this. This is a, f a picture that's come from a friend of mine who showed me her pet. Do you even know what that is? It's a flying squirrel. I was like, who would have a flying squirrel for a pet? <laughs> but she does. It's, as you can see, she even posts the squirrel for pictures. Very cute. So, exotic pets. Ferrets. You can get Salmonella, Campylobacter, Cryptosporidium, Toxocara, M. tuberculosis, Leptospira, Listeria, Hedgehog. You can get Salmonella, Trichophyton from that. Flying Squirrel. You can get Toxoplasma gondii, Staphylococci, or Cassia prowazekii. Monkeys. You can get Herpes B, Plasmodium, Nolesii, and Monkeypox. And for those of us who don't know what these animals look like, that's the ferret. That's a hedgehog. And that's a flying squirrel. <laughs> I have problems differentiating between hedgehogs and porcupine too. So I thought I'd enclose pictures on every slide. If I don't know what it is, I should enclose a picture of it. <laughs> So this is a picture of the hedgehogs that uh, was found to have the outbreak strain of salmonella, salmonella typhimeriums. Now this is the CDC report of the multi-state outbreak of the monkeypox in person exposed to the pet prairie dogs. Does anyone know about this outbreak? So the Gambian rat, which is the one on the left, is a huge rat that people in Africa use them out in the fields so it was imported to the United States as a pet. God know why people would want to have this as a pet. But anyhow, so the pet store would then group the Gambian rat with the prairie dogs. People would think to buy a prairie dog as a pet too. So then the prairie dogs acquired the monkeypox from the Gambian rats and then pass it on to humans. And then that's how monkeypox look like in humans. With that, we're moving on to our second part of the talk today. We were t discussing um, select bacteria zoonosis. Uh, maybe? Yes. Sure. Uh, is there any literature on HIV-infected patients and zoonosis? Uh, not 
that I'm aware of. Oh, HIV patient, whether they're more susceptible to zoonosis? Actually, there's a lot of data about it. We'll talk about it later. So let's start off with the questions. We have a 65 years old male who is seen for pneumonia. The patient have, has a non-productive cough, fever, headaches, anorexia for five days. He said that he have two friends who currently is hospitalized for pneumonia at another hospital. The last time he saw his hospitalized friends was about a month ago when they all gathered and play pokers. He remembered the evening very well because the family cat was giving birth to a litter in the same rooms with the poker games. <laughs> so on physical exam, the patient had a temperature of 102.2 degrees Fahrenheit. His, plop, um, his heart rate is 70, blood pressure is 128 over 88, respiration is a little tachypnic at 28. His chest exam is clear, white blood count is 6.2 with a normal diff. The platelet count is 55, obviously a bit low. AST and ALT are three times normal limit. The chest x-ray show an infiltrate in the right lower lobe. So which one of the following is the most likely cause of pneumonia in the tree fronts? Is it A, streptococcal pneumonia, B, Legionella, C, Coxiella, D, Listeria, or E, respiratory syncytial virus? Now, I'm hoping to present you a prototypical case with a very ridiculous scenario so that you will remember exactly what this is. It's Q fever. And this is how every time someone talks about Q fever, they always present this case because this is the case that was first reported in the New England Journal of Medicine. So it was first described in 1937. It was called query fever at the time because we didn't know what it was. It was designated a nationally uh, notifiable disease in the U.S. in 1999. It is a worldwide zoonosis. Human infection has been reported in every state in the United States. It caused by Coxiella bonetii, which is an intracellular bacterium that infect monocyte. Cattle, sheep, and goats are primary reservoir for Coxiella bonetii. This transmission <coughs> is usually occurred through inhalations of aerosol to contaminated soils or animal waste or body fluid in the case that I presented to you. So people that commonly get this disease are slaughterhouse worker, veterinarians, obviously, farmers. It also can be a tick-borne illness, or also in military personnel who are sleeping in barns and living near helicopter zones. As you can see, if they sleep near barns, they can get contaminated with animals. Or living near helicopter zones, so everything gets aerosolized and you inhale it, and that's how you get Q fever. So this is a um, case of a whole bunch of U.S. troops that got deployed to Iraq and all of a sudden developed Coxiella bonetii. Another uh, outbreak uh, among milk drinkers, raw milk drinker in Michigan in 2011. This is the case that make the journals and make this ridiculous scenarios is all the friends were playing pokers, and then the cat in the corner somewhere was giving birth, and then everyone inhales the aerosolized particles from the placenta, and everyone got pneumonia. And this article was published in the New England Journal in 1988. So this is a um, study from the CDCs showing the number of Q fever case from 1998 to 2010. As you can see, since 1999, when we identified this as a national um, reportable disease, we can see a trend in either the increase in number of cases of Q fever, or we just better recognize this is Q fever and reporting it. However, the uh, number of cases have trending down a little bit since 2008. And as you can see, in the uh, dark blues are the case of active Q fevers, and the top parts are the case of chronic Q fevers which is rare, complicated, and harder to prove, obviously. Now this is a map of all the state in the United States that have been have some case of Q fever reported. The one in bright red is the one that have from anywhere from one to five per million reported in each state. So you can see up top on the left, we start with Oregon, go to Nevada, Wyoming, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, 
and Arkansas and also DC was having a high incidence of Q fever as well. Florida is not so much. This is Q fever incident by age group and as you can see the group of people that get affected the most are people from 55 to 64 but after age 64 the incident decreased. I guess because after 64 you just don't go work in the barns anymore and therefore you're less likely to get Q fever. So manifestations for Q infections uh, patients usually develop antibody to the phase 2 antigens. The onset of symptoms usually occur within 2 to 3 weeks of exposure. Nonspecific febrile illness, they can get hepatitis or pneumonias in these acute infections. Or they can have asymptomatic infection followed by a zero conversion. However, infection in pregnant women can lead to meet miscarriage or preterm delivery. Now in chronic infections, you develop antibody to phase 1 antigens, which is different than, than the acute, you get phase 2 antigens. They manifest within a few months to several years after the acute infections. Can follow symptomatic or asymptomatic infections. So obviously you can see a patient who have chronic Q fever without ever remember having acute Q fever because they can have an asymptomatic infection period that they wouldn't know. But it's, it's rare. Less than 5% of all patients with acute infection would develop chronic infections, so that's good. But it's fatal if left untreated. Uh, the most common presentation in chronic infection is you would get culture-negative endocarditis. That's why we all send for serology for coxiella. Um, or infection of the aneurysms, if they have a pre-existing pre aneurysm, that can be infected. If they happen to have a Q, Q fever infection, it can go into develop chronic Q fever infections or if they have a vascular prosthesis like endovascular graft, like aortic graft, can get infected as well. The diagnosis of Q fevers, in the acute phase, you can send for PCR of whole blood or serums, um, or you can send for serology between the acute and convalescent specimens. If you have a fourfold increase in the serology between acute and convalescent, then you have your diagnosis. In chronic infections, you have to have an increase in phase 1's IgG, and it has to be more than 1 to 1,024, and a, an identifiable persistent infections. So you either have a vegetation on the heart, and you don't have a positive cultures, but then you have a positive serology. Or you have chronic infections of some sort, or you suspected an inf infected aneurysm, and then you have to have a positive serology as well. And this is all based on the CDC guideline currently. Or you can get PCR or immunohistochemistry or culture of the affected tissue. So if, in the case, if it go to affect your liver or your spleen, if you have a histodiagnosis on the tissue biopsy, then you have your diagnosis. Treatment of Q fever. Now treatment should never be withheld in the acute illness. So if you suspect someone having acute Q fever, if the story fit, go ahead and treat them for the infection while you wait for serology to confirm the diagnosis because obviously you have to have acute and convalescence. So by the time you wait for all that to come back, the patients either already improved or got a whole lot better or worse. However, in the case of chronic infection, then you want to confirm the diagnosis before you treat. So in the acute, you want to give doxycycline for two weeks for adult or children more than eight years old, or in the case of children less than eight or pregnant women, then trimetoprim sulfamethoxazole is the recommended drugs. For treatments of the chronic infections, doxycycline 100 twice a day and hydroxychloroquine 200 three times a day for one to two years. Now in the treatment of chronic infection, you have to do monthly serologic testing because cure is defining as the serology less than 1 to 200. So you have to treat and treat and treat until the serology falls down. And that's when you determine when to stop. Moving on to our next questions. We have a 41 years old car salesman from Baltimore who was admitted for a febrile illness and found to have positive blood culture with brucella. 
He had attended a dinner a month prior where some family members from Greece had bought, brought food from home. About two weeks prior to the onset of fever, he had bought some lambs and beef at a local farmer market. Does that remind you of all the ID questions, all confused and give you so many risk factors? So the most likely source of this infection is, is it A, homemade sausage from Greece, B, homemade goat cheese from Greece, C, beef tartar meat from the farmer market, or D, lamb kebabs, meat from the farmer market. <laughs> but you already know what this is, right? This is Prusella. So as we know, Prusella, you get that from eating homemade goat cheese. So brucellosis is caused by the bacterial genus Brucella. This is a small aerobic intracellular cocobacilli bacterium. You have different type of Brucella species. You have Brucella melitensis, which is acquired from sheep. You have Brucella suis, acquired from pigs. Brucella abortus, acquired from cattle. And Brucella canis, obviously, from dogs. The transmission is usually through contaminated food products or direct contact with the infected animals or to inhalations of aerosols. Brucellosis is also known as Mediterranean fever, Malta fever, or Onchulon fever. Now this is a worldwide distribution of brucellosis that was published in the Lancet of Infectious Disease in 2006. And as you see, the area of the Mediterranean countries are the one that have high prevalence for brucellosis. The one in red is the one that have the highest incident, which is Macedonia. Obviously, the United States is rare, not very common, not very endemic. That's Mongolia? Okay. Well, I, I read that Macedonia is the one that has the very high incidence. I think they have yes. a culture that's travels to all different country and eat bizarre food. All right, so coming back home. <laughs> so this is the uh, incidence of brucellosis in the United States. And as you can see, the state that you expect to have a high incidence of brucellosis are uh, states that have a uh, high level of immigrants, obviously. California, Florida, Texas. And moving a little bit closer to homes, we have a case of uh, brucellosis misdiagnosed in early stage of brucellosis suicide infection in a 46 years old patient. That was seen here at Hamilton General, reported by our very own Dr. Cho. <laughs> <laughs> now, the reason I brought this case because it's bring up a great teaching point. The blood cultures in this patient was actually detected positive, but it was not positive for brucella. It's positive for a cro ochromobactrum bacteria, which then changed the how, how long you would treat these type of infections and also the type of antibiotic that you would think would be appropriate for brucellosis infection. And that may or may not have contributed to the patient demise, but it's brought a great point. If the patient have a right scenarios to have Brucella infection. In this instance, the patient is a recreational feral swine hunter. Do so you know what that is? Okay. He hunt wild pigs for fun. He's a what? He's a recreational feral swine hunter. So if the story fit, obviously think of brucellosis. <coughs> Presentation for brucellosis. A dietary history is helpful, unpasteurized dairy products or raw undercooked meats or recreational history, obviously. Uh, fevers, the most common symptoms, anorexia, asthenia, fatigue, weakness, weight loss, which doesn't help you a whole lot because that's so, so nonspecific. Any febrile illness can cause that. However, arousal, low back pain, spine and joint pain with a predilection for the sacroiliac joints is more typical of brucellosis. Your patient can also develop neuropsychiatric symptoms such as headache, depression, fatigue, meningoencephalitis, neurologic deficit. GI symptoms can sometimes get also liver abscess. 
uh, the infection can affect their heart and they can get endocarditis with septic emboli. In the chronic form, the illness can last for more than a year and the patient may report a history of myalgia, fatigue, depression, arousia, and these are primarily caused by brucella melatensis rather than the other strain. Management of brucellosis, the blood culture is, is the diagnostic of choice in the acute phase. You can also send for serology with IgA and IgG. For treatments, according to the World Health Organization recommendations, in the acute phase, you would give uh, rifampicin or rifampin 600 to 900, uh, and doxycycline 200 once a day, um, 200 meaning 100 twice a day, for a minimum of six weeks in the acute infections. Well, however, according to the 2012 Cochrane Review, they recommend that doxycycline plus streptomycin for two to three weeks was to, found to be more effective, shortened periods of treatment also. Um, infection with complications such as meningoencephalitis or endocarditis, they recommend all three antibiotics are used, rifampicin, uh, tetracycline, and aminoclycosides are all used. Moving on, next questions. We have a 28 years old male who presented with fever of 39 degrees Celsius, diffuse myalgia, headache, malaise. The patient just returned for seven days from an Ironman triathlon in Hawaii. The physical exam revealed no localizing findings. Lab is remarkable for a white count of 14,500 with a predominant neutrophils, platelet of 210, total billy is 2.4, ALT slightly elevated at 45, AST slightly elevated at 52, l of 120, creatinine of 1.6, hematocrit of 45%, blood culture is negative, and the urinalysis is normal. So the most likely diagnosis, is it malaria, dengue, ehrlichiosis, or leptospirosis? Remember, these are in Hawaii. It's leptospirosis. It's caused by the spirit of genus Leptospiros, have a global distribution, however higher incident in the tropics and subtropics, and in the United States, tropic and subtropics, Hawaii's Florida. Not many other states are considered tropic or subtropics. Transmitted through contact with urines, waters, or soil contaminated by urines from animal reservoirs, such as rodents, dogs, mm -hmm. cattle, pigs, horse, or wild animals. There's recent outbreak in the U.S. They all associate with adventure race, as you can see, swimming, wading, kayaking, rafting, or triathlons, which is swim by and runs. Now, this is a picture of conjunctival injection in a 37 years old male with wild disease that was published in Lancet of Infectious Disease in 2011. As you can see, you can see scleroicterus as well as conjunctival injections in there. So manifestation of leptospirosis, you can get very high fever, headache, chills, jaundice, abdominal pain, diarrhea, and rash. The incubation period is anywhere from two days to four weeks. You have a distinct two phase to this disease. You have a first phase which have fever, chills, headache, muscle ache, vomiting, diarrhea. The patient then recover. And then they develop a more severe infections, kidney failures, liver failures, meningitis, known as Wild disease or icteric leptospirosis was first described by Adolf Wiles in 1886, and the characteristic triads for that is re renal failures, icterus, and splenomegaly. Diagnosis is by serology, and the treatment is either penicillin, uh, penicillin or doxycycline or septriaxones for five to seven days. So obviously, the treatment is easy. Five to seven days, one week. The key is to recognize what it is. Moving on, we have the next question. A 31 years old male who presented with three days of fever, headache, malaise, and myalgia. He works as a counselor at the Widerness Camp in Pennsylvania, where flying squirrels are commonly found. The exam is notable only for fever of 39 degrees, 0.6 Celsius. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Is it A, murin typhus, B, epidemic typhus, C, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, or D, tularemia, or E, is relapsing fever? Can't you venture a guess? Mitz? Did you just guess? You sure? You want to guess again? <laughs> it's epidemic typhus. 
So not only you have to know what it is, you have to know what it calls also. <laughs> because I'm sure you by now have recognized that this is Rickettsia prausawekii caused by flying squirrel. And flying squirrel is also aka known as epidemic typhus. In the United States, we don't get epidemic typhus, we get flying squirrel associated with typhus because we don't have refugee, refugee camps or crowded prison situations like in other countries. Now this is a report uh, in the Emerging Infectious Disease in 2003. It described uh, two cases of patients presented with the febrile illness that was traced to be um, associated with the flying squirrel because they either was exposed to it or having a flying squirrel as a pet. So it's caused by the Rickettsia prausawekii was also known as epidemic typhus or lousborn typhus, which is different than murin typhus. Have a total of 39 cases that was reported in the United States from 1976 to 2001. One third of all the cases have some sort of contact with flying squirrel. The flying squirrels are the only known vertebrate reservoirs for Rickettsia prausawekii. Transmission is occurred by inhalations or transdermal or mucous membrane inoculation of the infected louse feces. So you have an infected lice or a lice that bit the flying squirrels and then somehow you either inhale the material or the lice then bit you. That's how you get the infections. Diagnosis is by serology or PCR of the specimen through the CDC. The treatment is easy, doxycycline. When in down, just give some doxy. <laughs> the ID choice of vitamin D. Now, this is the epidemic typhus, uh, also called gel fevers, causing outbreak in Burundi, which is a country in Africa, or in other countries who have, you know, situations where they're at war and they have refugee camps or crowded situations when a whole bunch of people live together and the body lies for them, infestations and causing typhus fevers everywhere. The danger of typhus carried by lice. All right, moving on, almost home. We have a 45 years old male presented with ulcerated lesions on his fingers. The patient reported his initial symptoms start four months ago. <coughs> so this is four months ago. After his vacation in the Bahamas where he went fishing and scuba diving, he found to have a nodular lesions on his toe and legs that was later complicated with swelling in his knee. Because of the swelling in his knee, he was then subsequently diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis and started on prednisones. Swelling in the legs resolved, but then he noticed that there's multiple nodular lesions cropping up everywhere in his extremities, and the lesions in his fingers are now ulcerated. The physical exam was remarkable for the skin findings as seen. On his fingers, you can actually see where it breakdowns all the tissue, you can see the bones as well. So which of the following is the most likely cause of this syndrome? Is it nocardia, actinomyces, and marinums, and fatuidums? Yes. It's caused by mycobacterium marinum infections. It's the most common atypical mycobacterium to cause skin infections, known as fish tank granuloma. The transmission is usually tra traumatic skin inoculation, so the patient probably acquired this from either when he was handling the fish from fishing or from scuba diving and got cut on corals and things like that. Most patients will report some form of aquatic exposures, whether they you know, have a fish tank at home, or they went fishing, or they went scuba diving, or that's a case, the case report I read, it was very interesting, was there was a baby, a one month old baby, developed this type of infection, and then you ask yourself, how did the baby get fish tank granuloma? Well, the baby was bait in the bathtub, where they use the bathtub to clean the fish tank. The most common presentation is a localized cutaneous eruption that occur at the size of the inoculations. In the setting of immunosuppressions, you can get cutaneous or systemic disseminations that involve bones, joints, or visceral organ as well. The diagnosis by culture or histopathology of the tissue. Uh, the treatment is usually a combination of two or more antibiotics that include clarithromycin, rifampin, etambutol, minocycline, and Bactrim. 
And this is the case that I saw and presented at IDSA. And that was the patient that I presented to you. This is a case report of uh, disseminate mycobacterium marinum infection in patients that have rheumatoid arthritis receiving infliximab therapy. I brought this up because, as you can see, we're in the perfect state for this. People here love to go fishing or having own an aquarium or fish tank. And they have rheumatoid arthritis, obviously, and they get infliximab therapy or some sort of monoclonal antibodies. And obviously, later, we have disseminate infections of M. marinums. This is another case report of M. marinum infection causing septic arthritis and osteomyelitis. Similar settings, you know, you either come into a situation of immunocompromised and when you can get deep-seated infections with M. marinums. So, wrapping up, zoonotic prevention, good hand hygiene is key, especially after you pet your pets or handling your pets or changing out the box, the little box, anything like that. Hand washings. Pets should have routine veterinary visit treat it promptly for diarrhea or dermatosis. Uh, avoid feeding your pet raw meat or eggs. Pets should not be allowed to eat garbage or feces or hunt or drink non-potable water because that's how they get these infections. For the immunocompromised host, the high-risk groups are obviously the elderly, children less than five, pregnancy women, um, patient with HIV, asplenia, or patient on immunosuppressive therapy. Extra precautions should be uh, utilized when come in contact with animals or their environments like handle their pens or bedding or manure. The U.S. Public Health Service and the um, Infectious Disease Society of America recommended regarding pets and HIV patients. HIV patients should avoid animals less than six months old or one year, less than one year for cats. Avoid contact with animals that have diarrhea because if they have cryptosporinum or giardias, HIV patients can obviously get that and develop OI. Avoid contact with reptiles, chicks, or ducklings. Avoid contact with exotic pets. Use gloves when cleaning aquariums. Make sense? And these are my reference. Questions? <laughs>